Hey guys, it's Brian. Welcome to Financial Fitness. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. In this video, I'm going to talk about whether Canada Goose Parkas or Arcteryx Parkas are worth the money and how downfill power works. And we're starting right now. Even though this is a personal finance channel, I wanted to post something a little different that I've done research on since I get cold fairly easily before I bought a Canada Goose Parka and then more research before ultimately buying an Arcteryx Parka. I'll be looking at these parkas in a few ways. Is each brand worth it for the same price point of $1,000? Overall functionality, what features and value does each brand offer along with my opinion on the coats I've owned or currently own? Before I go into parka reviews, I'm going to explain the three factors that apply to how downfill works to keep you warm and how those factors can help you identify a good quality down parka, coat, or jacket to help distinguish Canada Goose and Arcteryx. Down insulation basically traps body heat between the many clusters of down within the coat to keep you warm. The less that is trapped, the colder you will feel. Ideally, you want the clusters of down to be bigger to retain more body heat, which translates to goose down. Duck down usually has smaller clusters and will retain less body heat. Goose down is more expensive to obtain and produce so you'll find it in fewer coats except the highest quality ones. Keep in mind that even though goose down is ideal, high quality duck down will perform better than mediocre goose down. Beyond goose versus duck down comes fill power. Fill power is the number that you see ranging from 500 to 900 when you first look at a down winter coat label as the first or second feature. It indicates the size of space one ounce of down is able to insulate when it reaches maximum loft or fluffiness. Fill power is a direct indication of the size of the down clusters in a parka, which is why goose down generates higher fill powers than duck down. You might have guessed that the higher the number, the warmer the coat might be given what I just explained, and you would be correct in that assumption, with a small exception. The fill power combined with the weight or the amount of down is what keeps you warm. These vials have the same weight of down in them, but the higher the down fill, the more space it covers and the fluffier it looks. Similar to the goose versus duck down quality comparison, the same goes for the fill power. What's interesting is that you will rarely actually find out the weight of the down in a specific coat you're looking to purchase unless you call the manufacturer and ask or ask an employee in a retail store. If you have a 750 fill power as an example, but you don't have that much of it in terms of weight, then a different coat could have 600 fill power, but with twice as much down weight and would be twice as warm if not more. A lot of companies do not actually list how much down is in a particular jacket, as you'll notice particularly with Canada Goose. Just something to note about Canada Goose, TEI level 1 and 2 jackets mostly use 700 to 800 down fill but the weight of the down is not significant, which is why they fall lower on their scale of warmth and why those jackets are light and not puffy. Although visibly you can see Canada Goose parkas are quite puffy once you get to TEI level three to four parkas, which all use somewhere in the 600 downfill range, but you'll see 625 or 675 downfill mostly, depending on the parka. 600 downfill is acceptable in terms of warmth, but it also causes these parkas to weigh close to five pounds if not more, especially the level four or five parkas, which are longer down to the mid thigh. TEI level three parkas are usually shorter and only go down as far as the hip. So for instance, with Canada Goose, they usually use lower downfill starting at level three and even up to level five, but the weight or amount of down in their parkas is fairly significant in this range, causing the parkas to weigh a ton. I know many of you won't think of it as a big deal while you're wearing it, but it was noticeable for me and I just found it unnecessarily heavy. I'll also point out that they use the hefty weight of the parkas as a selling point in their stores to market the idea that the fact that it weighs so much makes it superior compared to other down coats from potential competitors. This is partially true and partially not based on how down fill power and down weight work. When you look at their product lineup by TEI level, there are really only three coats in the TEI level five range that use 750 downfill, and those would be the Spreslet Parka, the Summit Jacket, and the Mountaineer, because those are meant for climbing. Pretty much everything else in the level four and five range uses 600 downfill, which is why all the jackets weigh a ton. The last factor to consider is down to feather ratio. 
you'll probably only see this on the inside tag of the coat rather than the label itself, but most commonly you'll see 80-20, which is acceptable. Ignore anything lower like 70-30. Ideally, you want to look for 90-10 as the gold standard. I haven't seen anything higher or closer to 100% down with no feathers at all. The Canada Goose Wyndham I owned had 90-10. Feathers are heavier than down, so you want less of them in your coat and more down instead to keep you warm. If I had to rank the three down factors in order of importance, I'd probably say down weight is the most important, then down fill, and then down to feather ratio. Just keep in mind the down weight you likely won't find easily or at all in some cases unless you physically try the coat on in a retail store or from a friend to visibly see how puffy it is. Now that you know how down works, I'll talk about my experience with Canada Goose and the Wyndham Parka. I owned for just over two years. So the parka itself I bought in a size small and was actually pretty good overall, but I had a few gripes with it after a couple winter seasons and individually most of them were not deal breakers except one, but together they were mildly irritating especially when I paid $9.75 which included taxes for the parka. So I'll start with what I liked about the parka and that would be that it was warm for the most part with some caveats. It was pretty stylish too, and retained pretty good resale value. I did get over the weight of the parka, but shortly after I discovered some other minor issues through wearing it. While I was out in the wild, and by this I mean I was walking around the city and running errands, the first issue I encountered became the bulky zipper. And you'll notice with any of the level 3 to 5 parkas with the exception of only a couple that use the non-bulky zippers, they all seem to have trouble zipping up without catching either the lining or the wind guard, and of course that didn't happen while I was at the retail store. Unzipping was not much of an issue, but that happened a couple times too. But it was mostly closing the jacket before you actually went outside that was the problem. This was mildly irritating when it was basically every time I put on the parka, but I said this was a minor issue, and maybe it was just this particular parka I picked out. I moved on from that, and then came the main functional reason I ended up selling it in the end, after two and a half winter seasons, and that was that it was only water and wind resistant. There was a day where I was on my way home and it was pouring rain with some pretty strong wind. By the time I got home after being out for maybe 30 minutes or so, I was soaked by the rain which went through the fabric and into the down, which started to make it clump up a bit. Not only did I find out about the poor water resistance, I discovered that I felt the wind also. I began to pay attention more on windy days and how strong the wind was based on weather apps and so anything above 18 to 20 mile an hour winds, the wind goes right through the parka which is awful. I remember briefly asking an associate while I was at the store before buying it about the wind resistance and they said that they make their parkas to be breathable so that you don't get too hot while wearing it. Clearly a marketing tactic. But at the same time, while well, yeah, you don't want to bake inside your parka, breathability should not sacrifice actual resistance from the wind. So in my opinion, this is a complete fail by Canada Goose. 20 mile per hour winds aren't even that high and the wind gets through the entire body of the parka. This lack of windproofing on all their flagship parkas is an issue. There are only about three parkas in their lineup that are windproof and waterproof which I mentioned earlier, which also have 750 downfill, the Screslet, Summit, and Mountaineer. Anyway, so that was a huge deal breaker for me since I no longer felt warm in the parka when it was too windy. To top it off, not only did I not feel warm when it was too windy, but it also couldn't be worn when there was too much rain, otherwise the down might clump up inside the parka. I ended up wanting to baby the parka, which makes no sense for something that costs $1,000, and only keeps you warm under certain conditions. You should be able to wear it and basically have it shrug off everything thrown at it. At this point, I already had decided to sell the parka, but then just before I ended up selling it, I also discovered two minor issues with the cuffs. The elastic cuffs were just slightly losing their elasticity after many times of putting it on and taking the parka off. The actual cuff on the parka was also slightly getting discolored from putting my hands in the pockets to keep them warm over time while wearing the parka. It honestly shouldn't have discolored at all since I rarely wore it every single day during the winter seasons. These two cuff issues were fairly minor though and not deal breakers by any means, but if you add on the weight of the parka, 
the dry clean only, the lack of windproof and waterproofing, it made the parka not functional for me any longer. Based on what I paid for the parka, I bought it including tax for just under $1,000 at 975 sold it for 800 and so I essentially paid $200 to rent the jacket for two and a half years, which was not too bad. I don't think the value is really there on any Canada Goose parka in my opinion, based on the overlapping features that are lacking between their parkas, most of them come down to style instead of function. They have about three parkas that may put function over fashion, the Screslet, the Summit Jacket, the Mountaineer, but that's small compared to their product lineup and not the main reason people buy Canada Goose. People buy Canada Goose purely for the brand and their clever marketing, partially for their function. I discovered all this the hard way and found out I really needed a waterproof and windproof down winter parka, which very few Canada Goose parkas offered anyway, on top of which at TEI level 4 or 5, none of them were 800 downfill or higher, which is why I started looking at other brands even before I sold my Wyndham parka. Here is how I ended up at Arcteryx. I was looking in the same $1,000 price range as a Canada Goose and thought that there has to be something better for this money. I like the functionality of Arcteryx gear, and since their gear is purely designed for the outdoors, it became a no-brainer for how functional they really are. When they're designing things meant for durability and functionality, like for all types of hiking, climbing, and even ice climbing, their gear is optimized for limiting weight, meaning durable and higher quality materials that are light, like 800 downfill and non-bulky reliable zippers to match their high pricing. It's hard to question the Arcteryx quality level after trying on and using their gear when comparing it to Canada Goose. On top of this, their trade-in program offers 20% back based on the original price of the item to use on your next Arcteryx purchase and their transparency for what each jacket or shell is specifically designed for is great for the customer. They have different collections based on the activity or type of climbing you're doing, along with product families and product modifiers to help you get the right jacket for what you need. It's a long list, so you might even feel compelled to go to a store to talk to an employee first. So let me get into what I purchased and some of the features which makes it warmer and better than the Canada Goose Wyndham Parka in my opinion. Besides the trade-in value potential at the end of the lifespan of their products, the durability and quality of their products is pretty great, which you'll realize once you try them on at a store. So I chose one of the warmest packable down jackets they have to replace the Canada Goose Wyndham. So you heard that right, a light packable Cerium SV hoodie is warmer than the big puffy and heavy Canada Goose Wyndham. Even though the Cerium SV is technically a mid-layer jacket, it's very slim fitting and closer to the body, which helps you stay warmer than I found when comparing it to the Wyndham in the same size small. By itself, I found the Cerium SV is just warmer and though not quite as puffy as the Wyndham due to the 850 Goose downfill, it's super light to the point where you wouldn't notice you had it on at all if it wasn't puffy to remind you of it. The weight of the entire jacket is less than a pound at 14.6 ounces and contains 162 grams of down based on a size medium, which is definitely not the case with the Wyndham, which is at least five to six pounds by my estimates, even though I didn't actually weigh it and put it on a scale. And Canada Goose doesn't post the weight of any of their parkas on their website, which I now find very interesting to sort of hide how extremely heavy they are when they obviously don't have to be at the $1,000 price range. To give you a full view of what the jacket looks like, I'm gonna turn around so you can see how puffy it is. It's not quite as puffy as the Wyndham parka as you can see, but the 850 goose down fill makes it quite lofty. Speaking of price, the Cerium SV hoodie is $575 at full retail price, which is almost half the price of the Wyndham. You can find deals on them, discounts during the holidays, or find them at the Arcteryx outlet in strange colors for closer to $400 so it's something to keep in mind. One of my favorite features is how well the storm hood actually covers your neck and face so you don't have to wear a scarf or anything around your neck. I'm going to zip it up fully and show you the coverage, which I don't think many of the Canada Goose parkas do quite as well. So here it is all zipped up, so you could see it covers my neck fully, and it even covers most of my mouth if, if it's like fully upright. Um, and it basically creates this tunnel around my face where if, if I turn to a side profile, you'll see that 
it covers pretty much everything and it only really leaves an opening for my nose, my eyes, and maybe a little bit of my mouth. It also has a no slip zipper, which you can see here, one, two, three, so that you can't accidentally unzip the coat. But it does get a little tricky even beyond price because the cerium is also water and wind resistant and not water or wind proof. So to add on to this purchase, I bought a Beta SV shell to wear on top of the cerium that is waterproof and windproof, which is made of Gore-Tex. There aren't many specs to mention, it's basically Gore-Tex with zippers. The cerium SV is actually a mid-layer that can also be worn as an outer layer, but in wet and windy weather conditions, a shell can be worn on top of it to keep all that warmth inside the shell and the water and wind out. So you can see if I'm, as I'm putting this on, it's kind of making a ton of noise. Um, but yeah, I, I would just wear a cerium underneath this and then that would make it water and windproof. The Beta SV is super durable when you feel it, short of cutting this shell with a knife. It should hold up to any activity you have in mind, including windy and wet weather. So you can see here, there's there's two really large zipper pockets. Um, there's some pit zippers here for ventilation on both sides. But there's really just not a whole lot to this. It's basically just a piece of Gore-Tex with uh, the zippers. Here's what the Cerium SV hoodie looks like with the Beta SV shell on top of it. So you can see as I'm putting it on, it's it's just making a, a ton of noise because of the uh, the Gore-Tex fabric. But so if I just zip this up, I mean it it's cut so that a mid layer can be worn underneath it uh, pretty comfortably. Okay, here's what it looks like with the Cerium SV underneath and the Beta SV shell on top. And so if I zip both of them up, I'll show you what the hood and the coverage looks like around your face. So this is just with the Cerium SV as you saw a second ago. And this is what it looks like with the Beta SV on top of it. And the Beta SV is helmet compatible, so there's enough space to fit a helmet underneath uh, the shell. The Beta SV is $675 at full retail price which can also be found for less online or at an Arcteryx outlet just like the Cerium SV. In any wet or windy weather, I'll wear the shell over the Cerium SV and it is 100% warmer than the Wyndham and I don't have to worry about it being too wet or windy. I've worn the Beta SV with winds up to 30 miles an hour around the city and it didn't get through the shell at all. Also for reference, when I say it's warm, I'm only wearing a base layer or shirt under either the Canada Goose Wyndham or the Cerium SV. The maintenance is super easy if you need to clean them at all, more than once every winter season. This goes with pretty much any Arcteryx jacket or shell. I don't recall seeing any that require dry cleaning. The only downside of wearing the Beta SV and the Cerium SV is that the shell does not have insulated pockets, so my hands get a little cold if I don't wear gloves. The reason the shell does not have fleece lining or anything like that is because it's designed for hiking and climbing to easily remove or put things into the pockets, which fleece lining would prevent. And also the shell itself has no insulation since it's meant to be layered on top of a mid-layer like the Cerium SV. The other downside mostly comes down to preference, which is fairly minor to me, and it's that most Arcteryx gear looks fairly similar with the exception of the colors. You likely can't tell most of them apart without the label at a glance, but the functionality, in my opinion, is more important than how similar they all look, so this isn't a downside for me personally. The great thing about having a shell like the Beta SV, or any shell, is that it can be worn on top of any jacket you own to be waterproof and windproof. 
it doesn't have to be an Arc'teryx piece. As far as pricing, I actually ended up paying only about $20 more for these two combined, including taxes, than I did for the Canada Goose window. I bought the Cerium SV hoodie for $4.94 and the Beta SV for $4.29, including taxes. The total came to $1,005. The Canada Goose Wyndham, including taxes, came to $9.75. It's basically a no-brainer trade-off from this standpoint. If you have the budget for Canada Goose or Arcteryx, the Arcteryx quality, durability, and ease of machine washing will beat out Canada Goose if you want the most functional jacket for your $1,000. Here are some points to summarize my thoughts on Canada Goose versus Arcteryx when comparing the two brands and their respective features. Canada Goose is more fashion over function. Arcteryx is function over fashion. Arcteryx is easier to maintain. Any mid-layer can be windproof and waterproof by wearing one of their shells over it. It's relatively in the same price range as Canada Goose with arguably better build quality and materials in my opinion. Arcteryx also has a pretty good trade-in program offering 20% back based on the original price of the item towards your next Arcteryx purchase. Although not all items qualify for the trade-in, insulated jackets are eligible and only specific types of Gore-Tex jackets are ineligible. Canada Goose does have a lifetime warranty but only on manufacturing defects and not normal wear and tear. I really hope Arcteryx will sponsor me one day to do other jacket reviews. But until then, I'll eventually put an affiliate link in the description below for the two Arcteryx pieces I mentioned, which are the Cerium SV Down Hoodie and the Beta SV Shell. I'm actually still looking for another Arcteryx parka at some point, but one insulated 850 downfill jacket that is both waterproof and windproof so I don't have to wear gloves. I hope this video was helpful for you in your search for the perfect winter parka or jacket. Let me know if you have any questions or comments about anything I mentioned in this video. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you liked this video and found it insightful. Click the like button if you did, and please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the notification bell so you can see when I post videos next. Feel free to leave comments, questions, and any topics you might want to hear about in future videos to get on track to being financially fit. See you in the next video.